and we will at this time go straight into our work session first order of business on the work session will be to see if any commissioner would like to discuss any preliminary items for the next board meeting which all right hearing none we will go to our discussion items item number one will not be discussed that's the update on camera uh, the camera pilot program we will not have that this afternoon next will be Ohio River South leg legislative update <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, good evening, commissioners. My name is Howard Franklin. Uh, back to present to you post the Georgia General Assembly. I've got with me a couple members of the Peachtree Government Relations Team, and I think I think we initially scheduled our we assumed our our ability to, to present would be around six. So I think we have one or two others who will likely be rushing in very quickly. But we do have a PowerPoint here that I will direct your attention to. Um, and it's really a recap of this most recent Georgia General Assembly with a number of the legislative priorities uh, that came forth from both leaders in the community as well as leaders on the dais from the county commission. So next slide, please. Um, as you all are very well aware, the Georgia General Assembly gaveled out on Sonny Die March of 28th. Uh, it was an active session. We're going to go through a number of the bills that came through both chambers. Um, but worth noting, the governor has 40 days from Sonny Die. Uh, to sign or to veto legislation. Uh, there might be a couple pieces of legislation here that uh, warrant that additional attention. I believe the date or the deadline uh, for that 40 days is May the 7th, so just worth noting uh, here. Um, next slide, please. Worth, again, noting there's been some changes in the Georgia General Assembly in terms of the Clayton County delegation. Um, as always, we'll have Senator uh, Gail Davenport as an incumbent who is seeking re-election, but we do have both an open seat and a new uh, representative, or in this case, a new senator, just based on reapportionment and new lines being drawn. So uh, largely uh, DeKalb County-based Senator and Elena Parent has been drawn into a significant portion of Clayton County. I imagine she's been spending some time here and getting to know uh, all of you as well as other stakeholders throughout the, uh, without the region and throughout the county. And then also an open seat for Senator Valencia C, who I believe served 22 years in the August body. So again, just want to acknowledge that we'll have a little bit of challenge, a little bit of change. And we're also going to be changing in terms of the seniority and the makeup of the Clayton County delegation. Next slide, please. Um, these are other members of the delegation. Um, I think, in, uh, as you can see here from the slide, there are some challengers, but we'll see what happens on May the 21st. Just want to acknowledge that we do have the, the potential for change anytime that we're, particularly when we're following uh, reapportionment. Next slide, please. And other members of the delegation, unopposed. So all these folks that, that you see the smiling faces of will be back uh, in the 2025 Georgia General Assembly. Um, I'm going to bring up PGR to talk a little bit about some of the budget stuff, and then we're going to probably ping pong back and forth on some of the bills of uh, interest. Yep, uh, your staff's done a great job of uh, working with us on the budget issues. Uh, two items we wanted to bring up in particular are LMIG dollars. A lot of new money has come into the budget. As you know, the budget's really divided in two pieces. There's what they call the FY24 amended budget, which covers January 1 of this year to June 30th of 2024, and the FY25 budget, which begins July 1 of 2024 and ends June 30th of 2025. In both budgets, there was additional LMIG money. The important thing to note here is that the dollars available in the uh, amended FY24 budget, uh, as we list here, um, the $212 million, the, the applicants or the applications should start now. And I think your staff's been diligently working at applying for those dollars. Every single city and county is eligible for that money. Obviously, GDOT's looking for projects that can make impacts. Uh, they need something that's ready to go, shovel ready. So I know you have lots of great projects you want to fund. And so uh, your staff's been working diligently to put in those projects. They must be designated before June 30th of this year. Uh, and then the additional LBIG money for FY25, those dollars can be designated through <coughs> June uh, 30th of 2025. Uh, there is some additional money that came through HBDDH, and uh, that's $35 million that can be set aside for domestic violence shelters that, as you see fit, you may make an application for those dollars. Next slide. I'll let you take this one too. Yeah. Um, 
Um, this was a bill that a lot of folks at ACCG and GMA <laughs> wanted. It would have allowed you to increase the, 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 the dollar amount for projects that, wouldn't, that would be exempt from bidding. Uh, it actually passed last year and was vetoed by the governor. Uh, this year, the, the bill started making through its process for whatever reason, and many, many bills. It was a very unusual session. Many bills did not get final passage. They were left on what they called the table at the end of uh, day 40. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. Yes. Just if we could pause for one quick second, because I know that the board members are fully understanding these acronyms, but it's important for those to understand that are listening out there. The Local Maintenance and Improvement Grant that is um, through the Georgia Department of Transportation, mm -hmm. which allows for us to use those federal dollars, that state dollars of what we're talking about now, for our road projects. So what does that equate to for you? For us to get rid of more potholes. Yep. Yep. Please Go proceed. Ahead. Um, House Bill 581 by Representative Shaw Blackman passed the House and Senate along with H.R. 1022. This is a very important bill for every county, city, and school board to think about. It's called the Floating Homestead. And what it, uh, the original iteration of this bill was very detrimental. Uh, GMA opposed it. ACCG was trying to make some changes to it. And uh, most of the school board's associations opposed it as well because it, was an, it didn't have an opt-out option. In other words, whether you had a floating homestead or not, you were going to get one if the voters approved it, which they likely would in November of this year. House Bill 581 has passed, allows for an opt-out option. And if you are a city, and each city, each county, and each school board must individually have public hearings, they must have two public hearings, and then vote as a, as a group to opt out by March 15th of 2025. If you do not, the floating homestead will be imposed on the, the county. And what that effectively means is that for a homestead property in Clayton County, the property taxes may not, uh, if your assessment goes up 100%, it doesn't matter because your exemption will float so that you will never pay more than 3% in property taxes year over year. And in some cases, it works great. In some communities that have a lot of industrial, a lot of commercial, it, it works fine because they're relying on that base. But if you rely heavily on homesteader properties for revenue, it could have a big effect on your budget, something you guys need to think about. Uh, and every city in Clayton County needs to make an individual decision on opting out of this. So it's, a, it's an important <coughs> bill. We'll see what happens. But I suspect that the measure will pass as a statewide constitutional amendment in November of this year. It's unlikely the voters would deny this, and so it's something we should start contemplating right away. Would there be a specific time period that each um, government entity would have to meet in order for the opt-out, or is it just contiguous? It just has to be prior to March 15th, and on March 15th, the, by March 15th, the, the county commission needs to vote to either opt-out or not vote at all, and then you'll be automatically opted Outing in. in. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to take a, um, HR, the Saints bill or not? No. Oh, okay. Okay. okay, yeah, okay. So one of the other issues that was a big topic for this legislative session was elections. Um, what we kind of saw was throughout the session, the Senate in particular kind of led on uh, these changes and these policies. And in the 11th hour, uh, what's called an omnibus bill, which is a bill that contains multiple provisions, multiple languages from other bills were all put into one bill. So it ended up being a pretty sweeping piece of legislation um, around elections. But uh, essentially, they're beginning an overhaul of the current uh, election system. And this included uh, removing tabulation by QR codes for ballots. So our current system has QR codes on your ballot. Uh, and it gets scanned for tabulation. This law, if it was to be signed by the governor, uh, would essentially make it illegal for tabulation by QR code despite it staying on your ballot. Um, they're looking at completely changing the system and putting upwards of $250 million from the state to uh, bring these changes down to the county level. Um, one of the provisions in this bill, though, that, that I think was positive was brought forth by a DeKalb County legislator. And DeKalb County is running into some similar issues around vacancy in, in their uh, county commission and not being able to set a special election. Um, mm -hmm. They included a provision that would fix this only if it was to be signed and only for the years to come. But uh, there's there's good and bad both in this bill, and we've heard from a multitude of organizations that are fighting for the, the signage of it by the governor, but also fighting for a veto of it. 
<clears throat> Next slide. So a number of these uh, pieces of legislation were actually county priorities uh, that we heard from you about before we started in the General Assembly. I'll take them from the bottom. Um, the delegation chairwoman and Yasmin Neal carried a piece of legislation essentially to create uh, public facilities authority. It essentially would allow the county through this new vehicle to save money on um, the construction and investment in county facilities. I think it was obviously a high priority uh, for a number of different projects that we've talked about um, over time for the county. Uh, so I know you all will be very familiar with it. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm... 11, House Bill 1146, uh, passed or carried by Chairman Ron Stevens, was focused on uh, requiring, I believe, the issuance of water permits in unincorporated areas where service otherwise would not be, uh, wouldn't be available from wherever, whatever source was otherwise providing the water service. So I, as I understand it, this is an economic development bill, one that, particularly for a county like Clayton, does have some unincorporated areas and does still need the delivery of service for private entities that otherwise wouldn't have access to it. And then um, as we've done over the years, uh, we've had a number of issues around pegging uh, the salaries of leaders and members of the judiciary um, to essentially to a static, uh, a, a static number so that we're not, uh, the, the county isn't behind where other competing jurisdictions are in terms of being able to provide and recruit for uh, judicial talent um, f to represent the county um, and where the road behind the bench. Uh, next slide. And so a couple of these are ACCG priority bills. Again, I'll just uh, to the point that was made earlier, Association of County Commissioners of Georgia for the folks who are in the room, uh, a group that we work very closely with. Um, and in each of these cases, uh, the ACCG, who represents Clayton County, was supportive. So we've, we had a, a bill that essentially would increase the public works threshold, but it did fail. I think it was mentioned earlier. Uh, it's one that has come before us before, and obviously the governor in, in the last, last year of uh, the legislative session was willing to veto it. Uh, service delivery strategy law revisions. I may ask my colleagues to speak to a couple of these others. And the single county T splast was uh, or were two that mattered to us quite a great deal. I know we talked about uh, the single county T splast in years past. So glad to see House Bill 946 uh, come forward, and as well as service delivery strategy law revisions. I'm not I'm not as confident or clear on exactly what uh, ACG, ACCG and what the county's position was here. So I'll, I'll happily have PGR speak to this. But the last bill here, Senate Bill 293. 293 also passed uh, both the House and the Senate, and it essentially uh, empowers local uh, control with the district health directors. And ACCG here, in one case, was actually neutral on that on that point. Um, pause for one second, sure. Mr. Franklin. So once again, for those that are here, oh, I wait for permission to speak. I apologize. Uh, you've already started. Please proceed. Okay. So basically, um, for the citizens, HB 1407, you do want to make sure that you take a look at that. The service delivery, stra delivery strategy law revisions are directly related to the services that the county provides on behalf of both incorp I mean, unincorporated and incorporated citizens when you're talking about the fire department and so forth. Just want to make sure that while you're here, you know that pertains to you. The other thing is the T-SPLOS, just to give more additional information, that's um, the transportation SPLOS, which allows for us to once again be able to make sure that people um, are riding on roads that are a little bit smoother, as well as to be able to ensure that people can get from one destination to another. Thank you for the clarification, uh, you know, Commissioner. Frankly, in a particular piece plus, I think is in keeping with a number of the things we've heard from this commission, from this community, about having more self-determination in terms of where economic development right. and infrastructure dollars ultimately go. Uh, next slide. So um, always important to us, sometimes we'll have measures that have been hotly debated and contested, and sometimes they make it through the General Assembly. Oftentimes, when they do not, what we are left with is a study committee where Members of both chambers will say, this is a big issue. It's obviously impacting a number of constituents in the state of Georgia. We do want to spend more time, but we want to spend that time uh, before we make a decision, final or otherwise, on those issues. So there are a number of them here uh, that, that we'll be tracking that may have impact on things that are priorities for Clayton County. Um, a couple that jumped up for me were um, 
the alternatives to opioid, opioids for pain management. And I think we also talked a bit about the credit card fee on state sales and excise tax impact on Georgia merchants and consumers. But a number of others may have implications for what's happening in the county, county business, and other stakeholders. So we certainly welcome any input you have for us to be laser focused on these as they go forward. And again, worth noting, uh, these get approved during the General Assembly. Uh, hopefully they will survive the governor's veto pen through May the 7th. And then they typically will meet three times between now and December where they'll issue a final report. And oftentimes the following legislative year is when we'll see legislation come forward based on what findings um, were, were, were held in these actual study committees. Uh, next slide. I wanted to mention one thing about study. Sure. Uh, one thing I did want to mention about study committees, as, the, as you as commissioners look through these study committees and decide you have a passion for any of them, please let us know because this is an opportunity for you to testify. Mm -hmm. And we can let you know in advance if we know that this is a committee you want to testify in front of, we can get you that audience with the chair of the study committee. We could make sure you have a few minutes to go and, 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 and speak your piece, so to speak, to the General Assembly and help mold how they make, what recommendations they make for the next session of the General Assembly. Thank you. Uh, ditto. Uh, Senate Resolution 476 is one that's gotten a lot of attention in the Study Committee on Artificial Intelligence. There's been a lot of discussion about how it's going to change a number of things about the way we currently live, um, you know, delivering services uh, at the government level all the way to private companies. So just wanted to mention this one, but I just would echo uh, what, what Don said here. We definitely want your input for the study committees that matter to you. Next slide. Uh, this is all of our contact info, even though we're not all here in this moment. Uh, but as you guys know, one thing I just want to mention before we close out, one of the priorities that we've heard a lot about over the course of our representation of the county is arriving at a more equitable uh, revenue, sharing, uh, revenue sharing agreement with Department of Aviation, Hartsfield, Jackson, Atlanta Airport. And what we found is that over the course, and I, I think I spoke to a little bit of this at the beginning of this presentation, um, as we've had new leaders elected and appointed to different positions, what we found in talking to different stakeholders, whether it's the city of Atlanta, uh, Atlanta City Council, the mayor's office, Department of Aviation, uh, or state lawmakers who may or may not be as familiar with what took place some seven or eight years ago that really put us in this conundrum to begin with, is that we didn't really have a singular accounting of all the things that took place and really a way to help decision makers both equitably understand and make recommendations for how we go forward. So we really want to take it upon ourselves to both reset this discussion. So we came up with, we, we built a timeline from the outset of this discussion, or really starting in 2018 that we intend to share with you, as well as a strategy document to really give us the tools to both share, again, with these stakeholders who in some cases have been responsive and in other cases have not. And also just to make sure that the various stakeholders that are pulling in the same direction, that want to see Clayton County, Clayton County Schools, and the various constituents uh, of, the, of this community made whole financial and otherwise. So what we're proposing, uh, both as a part of this recap, but just as a, also as a part of our service, is to get everyone together, the delegation, the county commission, other stakeholders that you may see as important, Department of Aviation, uh, you know, Delta Airlines, et cetera, and really just start with, from scratch, at what has happened, what positive steps we have made, some of the discussions about uh, years past where we were able to get state lawmakers to consider ways that they could help make us whole, uh, consider pots of money that they could tap into to address uh, what we've lost, and then come forward with some, uh, some solutions that we can agree upon and speak to with a unified voice. I think that's what's been missing. We hear you guys have an active delegation who've got their own legislative priorities. We've got a number of, uh, again, stakeholders, the City of Atlanta, Department of Aviation. We would love to get everyone on the same page. We'll take whatever form you allow us to do that in, but we think this is a, an issue that's deserving of that degree of focus, and we want to make sure that we're serving you by addressing it in a way that will bring everyone to the same table. So just I wanted to mention that, happy to talk about this more, and I can tell you from Tyler and Don and the rest of our team, our intent is after, after making this presentation, answering your questions, our intent is to follow up with you all, and including the other stakeholders that we've mentioned as a part of this process. But uh, at this point, we'll take any questions you have. Yeah, let me start off by saying uh, I agree somewhat of what you just said, but <laughs> There has been a lot of conversation around revenue lost and how to discuss ways of uh, recouping some of that lost revenue. Uh, we provided 
not only to yourself, but to the stakeholders in Clayton County, i.e. the school system, the delegation, this board, uh, COO provided some information in reference to the delivery services that we provide at the airport, but don't get any revenue. From. 100%. You're right. Uh, so we don't need to start from scratch. Uh, there is a uh, white paper or a historical document that we can refer to, but getting all the stakeholders together to continue the talk, which we are have been continuing, uh, is paramount because there is a lot of revenue that we're not getting out of the airport that we definitely would, would the, the taxpayers and citizens of Clayton County deserve nothing Agreed. less than to be able to capitalize even more so because I, I would be disingenuous if I said that we don't get anything out of the airport. Sure. But there's so much more that we should be getting that we're not getting. And we're going to continue to fight and fight and fight until we see something in that respect. So I appreciate 100% that. agree with you. And just let me apologize. My suggestion wasn't that we haven't been working on this issue, but just that we believe with some of the changing of the guard that mm -hmm. folks need to know how urgent an issue this is and also broaden the scope of potential solutions uh, that they are willing to consider for us to come together and address this issue. Yeah, and, and, I, and I will agree there has been numerous stakeholder yeah. changes, especially in the city. I think we've spoken to three different mayors. You're about right. This. You're right. And uh, we're still going to push. We're still going to push through it. Thank you. Are there Mr. any other Chair, questions? Mr. Chair, yes. Go ahead. First of all, thank you for that clarity because one thing we don't want to do is assume someone knows anything because that will lead you down to a path that you will, uh, of no return. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. And I know that staff uh, will work diligently with you on that. Um, additionally, though, um, with the airport, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that this is not a unique situation uh, for Clayton County only. Um, the um, amount of funds that we are not receiving from that airport because it sits within the county, majority of it does, however, it is run by a city, is also the same situation in I think at least two or three other jurisdictions throughout the U.S. So as we know, there is um, power in numbers so, and I love your suggestion, but what I would like us to do is go a step further and make sure that we are uh, communicating on a regular basis with those other individuals through um, our relationships that you all can help us form. And then of course, so what's available to us through the National Association of County Officials. I think that's going to be able to resonate a lot, but um, the citizens need to know, as you just said, bringing Delta to the table, that's a giant you're trying to bring to the table, but you know what? Even giants can, um, can uh, change a course at times. I do have a quick question for you, however, and I apologize for negating it earlier, but it's SB 293, and it's dealing with the district health directors. I received a couple of emails today in regards to there being a discussion about merging our health district yeah. with DeKalb County. So is there any other information that you could provide us with that, and how was it addressed through this or not? and how will it affect us either way? Yeah, that that's a great question. Um, so I, I'd start by saying, in essence, the discussion, and, and I think the, the charge that the county sent us to the General Assembly with was to go down to the General Assembly and to better understand what, what willingness DBHDD had to fund our CSB, uh, the Clayton County CSB. And what we heard um, from the commissioner of, of, of that body was that his intent is actually to take, I think it's 21 or 22 CSPs from across the state mm -hmm. and to consolidate. And that mm -hmm. his internal staff have already done uh, their due diligence to figure out where they see opportunities for consolidation, but that they do want in, the, in, in every instance where they're asking for partnership and consolidation to make sure that communities that could be perceived as having lost uh, an investment or lost um, you know, facility in community can also see upside ups and gain. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we were told by this leader, and I think the um, leaders in the delegation are also very well aware of the discussions at least, um, really twofold. One was that at present there weren't new dollars for operation operating the, C, the Clayton County CSB that would be recommended by a DBHDD, right? And ultimately what ends up happening is their recommendation carries the day. So they put forward who they recommend deserves additional dollars for capital improvement and for operations. And after that, we're really just we're advocating for in a void I, I think separately what we what we asked the commissioner for or or relatedly was 
what sort of proposal would come forward so that you and members of this August body as well as the delegation and other stakeholders could actually look at what this looks like. Is there mm -hmm. a fair deal to be had? Are there economies of scale uh, to be enjoyed, et, et cetera, so that we'd at least be able to meaningfully assess whether or not this is something we want to continue or consider or if this is something that the county wants to take on as a, as a, as a line item and a fiduciary responsibility of its own. So that, yeah. that's, that's what the the genesis of those discussions were. I think the, the last um, conversations that I was aware of, the commissioner wanted to talk directly to our delegation chairwoman and, and uh, Representative Neal, and I, I'm aware that they've had some conversations. I don't, I'm not exactly sure where we left uh, those conversations, and if they're, if they're, my understanding is that we didn't come to any agreement, but we will reiterate our request for specificity about this proposal ultimately. And, and the good news is that they can't force our hand, but right. the bad news is that there is, there are dollars attached to whatever recommendations come out of that office. Thank you. And I've got two very important questions as a piggyback on what you said. The first one I'm going to begin with is understanding that because of the fact that we are the jurisdiction that those within the airport, which oftentimes are the homeless, that are being arrested at that airport who come to our county um, jail, those individuals do have mental health issues. So has that been taken into consideration at all? You know, so what I can say is I think yes is the answer. I know that our COO uh, and our, our chairman in the in the document that I saw that went to the city of Atlanta around revenue sharing, there was definitely consideration for the additional and undue financial stress that's put on the county for exactly what you're talking about. I'm, I don't have as much specificity. When the commissioner came to us with this discussion or with this idea, um, I think he was coming at this from a very different perspective, which was how can... I find new economies of scale and new efficiencies in taking this number of CSBs from I want to say again 21 or 22 to I think his number was 13 or 14, Ooh. and he and that and that's was across the state. That, of Georgia. That's across the state of Georgia, wow. not just uh, not just Clayton County. So that that's an ongoing conversation. Again, his office doesn't dictate that, but there is a recommendation for funding, and ultimately, yeah, I know that the county's willing to make capital investment. I think the question I think we're all asking here is about the operational investment the county's willing to make. Right. One more quick question regarding that are you able to share which metro atlanta um counties did receive additional funding yeah absolutely i don't know it off the top of my head because uh, mm -hmm. we've just been focused on clayton in this case and mm -hmm. uh, you guys are the only county we represent in this case right. um but happy to get back to you quick fast and in a hurry with that information whether we go directly with the commissioner or if we're just we find it through other means well, awesome so for uh, for the record even though this is just a work session the reason i asked that question is because i'm interested in knowing if it's fulton county who generally does get the additional funding because they're a state within a state um, which does flow down to Atlanta, and then I'm interested to know if it's DeKalb. One of the things that came out in the email is that the d new director of, um, mental, of um, the mental health um, director is thinking about merging us with DeKalb County. There are great concerns for that, number one, because you're merging us with a county that doesn't even have as much of an effect on us as Fulton and the city of Atlanta. That's number one. Number two, you're merging us with a larger county, which both have uh, are considered almost states within a state, and we're going to get lost in the middle of all of that. So if a merger has to occur, then it seems like the more logical fit would be to merge with a county such as Fayette County, who has been asking to be able to work with Clayton County to leverage that overhead cost. That's some things that, um, something I've been talking to the um, commissioners of uh, Fayette County, and they've actually brought that forth to us so just something to kind of keep in no, mind. that's really great information and I, again uh, the impression I got from our DBHD commissioner was a willingness to talk this through and to figure out what the best solution was going forward so I think he, he had an idea when we first heard that this had been discussed and that his staff had already informed some of the the conclusions that they had reached but this sounds like something that would be would be, would be great to bring back to if him. he's genuine he'll have a meeting with all of us and not just one individual and I set that purpose at least so hopefully y'all can deliver that message and I approve that message because the people deserve much better <laughs> thank you so much thank you for the question thank you let me say this exactly what you just spoke on Commissioner Franklin is exactly the conversations that's being had there's health districts that's in certain quarters or quantrums throughout the state that according to the Commissioner uh, Tanner okay, yeah. that this if it happens would be the best fit 
and at the, ultimately it's going to be his decision. Uh, but there's also an impact to this community, and, and you're right about the monies that would come through would be regulated and handled by the Cab County. But when it comes down to whether or not we merge with Fayette, uh, I think at one time before there was Spalton County, yes. Butts County, uh, and now they're talking about the Cab County, but it's just the Cab. It would just be would it be just be the Cab and Clayton? It would just be the Cab and Clayton. And, and uh, I neglected to say I think part of the uh, Commissioner Tanner's rationale was pairing some of the larger and more financially solvent CSBs with those who didn't have as much resource to bring to the table. I, I don't know the status of where Fayette is, but I think this is all meaningful. And again, I think he came to the conversation already having some idea, but I don't think, I think we would, he would be better served to hear from us and from you directly about what sort of needs there are and where there's contiguous and corresponding need. I think that that's something he absolutely signaled a will willingness to hear. As a headline, that sounds good, but until they give us some numbers, then I, I'm not believing it. And I think this is not a good decision for our county until I see something different. Yeah, but unfortunately, it's a Commissioner Tanner's decision. Uh, but we can still try to force his hand and right. let him know why we benefit by keeping ours the, the way it is currently. Yeah. And Chairman, yes. um, as a member, as a board, the board of manager of ACCG, this is something that I vehemently opposed. Yep. Uh, Fulton County. We're fighting is by this. themselves. Gwinnett is by themselves. Cobb is by themselves. Um, we have many of these metro Atlanta counties that are not in partnership, mm -hmm. but we're the only one that has been held to a lower standard, I should say, in putting us under that. And with the opioid funding now coming down the pipe and applications going out as of yesterday, for the most part, what are we going to get? We have to go to DeKalb, DeKalb County to find out what we have to get. Well, the decision hasn't been made. It, it has been made, and I think this is something for the next session we've got to begin to address. Anything, I, I just want to real quick say anything that's done can be undone. I want to make sure we're clear on that. Again, that's power in numbers. If you could, and I agree with um, uh, Commissioner Davis on that, because I too, as he stated, very involved <laughs> with um, other elected officials, and this is a concern. And we shouldn't just take it and accept it. Uh, we need to push back against it. Everybody has a boss at the end of the day who and remind us uh, to the audience who actually appoints this commissioner, Commissioner Tanner. Uh, governor yeah. makes, makes that appointment. Well, appoint. that's my point. Yeah. And an election is coming up. Yeah. And let's all keep that in mind. Well, I just, again, just to wrap this up, because I know there, I mean, we are happy to have more conversations like these. I, and I'm really, I'm, I'm appreciative of the interest you all have taken in this particular issue. What I would say, you know, Commissioner Davis, I'm so glad you mentioned ACCG. I think we mm -hmm. mentioned a couple bills that have been supported by ACCG. I, we should definitely strategize about pulling our association into this fight. I know that there are other counties across Georgia's 159 that are also impacted by this and have probably also have conversations like the ones we have with Commissioner Tanner. We would love to make this a, a statewide issue and an issue that the association would, would pick up for us to, to uh, acknowledge the strength of numbers that we heard from the dais earlier. So, Chairman, Chairman, may I ask one last thing? Go ahead. As, as far as the airport goes, did I hear you say you have a strategy in place or you're putting a strategy in place? Yeah, so we, we've been pursuing a number of strategies that you heard from the chairman, right? We have we worked on a piece of legislation. I'll just give a, a quick recap. We worked on legislation to administratively or legislatively compel um, the city to start to pony up or to pay some of the lost revenues we've gone directly and I think um, the COO and the, and the chairman and other members of the of the staff have been most engaged in the conversations directly with Department of Aviation Hartsfield Jackson and the mayor's office uh, we've talked about and I know you guys have kept us abreast of some of the federal efforts that have been made to potentially uh, revise some of the rules that ultimately made it impossible for those taxes uh, coming from an enterprise zone to be paid out to an outside jurisdiction in the first place so I think at every level federal state and local we have been engaged. We just we realize that this is a, a, a very big lift. And it's, it's so far, it seems that the solutions that we've been able to wrangle out of the partners that we have haven't met with your approval. So we want to make sure we're saying, let's reset, let's, let's clear the board, and let's figure out all the things that are at our disposal. If, if there is a strategy in place, can this board get a copy of your strategy with your timeline and milestones? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Great did, job, you, you all. Did you have some? I did.
Chairman, Vice Chair, and, and Commissioner um, Franklin. Uh, two other things that we want to ensure that we highlighted. Um, of course, Ohio River South and, and uh, Peachtree government relations do a phenomenal job in providing us context about our state relationship and also ensuring that they work with our local delegation on a lot of different fronts. I just want it for um, public consumption that there's been discussions with our senators who have done a phenomenal job in making some traction from the FAA side of the House. Um, if we all remember, um, Senator Warnock and Senator Ossoff did a phenomenal job in ensuring that they got a uh, um, some of the preliminary discussion through the House Committee um, up in D.C. to ensure that from a funding standpoint we actually are at least at the table to have discussions about how that additional funding can come to the county. And so one of the two things that we're doing from a strategic standpoint as we work with our lobbyists is two things. Not only ensuring that they're hearing that conversation from a federal level, but also ensuring that as we get that information, there's more solvent discussions with our local community to ensure that our citizens hear specifically what we're doing from a legislative standpoint to ensure that that actually is being at least escalated in a different way. So we're working directly with the department heads that may have more of a synergistic relationship with some of our, our lobbying um, initiatives to ensure that they're communicating with their staffs as well as communicating with the different constituency within your respective districts to ensure that they're at least hearing about it before it comes before a work session. So therefore, if the community have some general questions about the direction we're heading in from a strategy standpoint, they're hearing it before we bring it to the board um, in a, I guess, a policy discussion way. So therefore, we can kind of answer some of the general questions about some of the elementary things that might be taking place to at least educate our general public about our lobbying efforts. So those kind of the two um, delineations that we're making as far as change. One, talking about our relationship from a federal standpoint, and then more importantly, ensuring that that information to our local constituency is being heard in a different way. So we just wanted to make sure that we kind of elevated that as we talk specifically about our lobbying initiatives as our lobbyists come forth and give you these quarterly updates. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, I think the gentleman, uh, the, Mr. Cameraman, wanted to get his mic. Come on down. <laughs> All right, as he's coming to next, we will hear the Leadership Awards Program. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Franklin. Is our Chief Finance um, Director here to charge him rent for leaving that mic up there? Yes. <laughs> Chief Merks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the board. Um, mm -hmm. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. On the desk in front of you should be your official Welcome to the Shift t-shirt. Um, feel free to put it on real quick if you want to. Um, but um, <laughs> it, it is indeed an honor to come before you um, this evening and update you on where we are with the shift um, and some new initiatives. Um, but before I get into it, I would like to recognize uh, members of our department leadership who came out tonight um, to support this initiative and this effort as this is for them and this presentation is for them. So if y'all would please stand. Yay. Fellow shifters. <laughs> and then specifically um, members of my staff, the COO's office, um, Dr. Adhikari um, and our Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer Jay Fordham for helping me build out this program. Um, in conjunction with the COO. Go ahead, please. Thank you. So real quick, our agenda, we're just going to give you a quick update on the shift, um, the awards program and our objectives, and then kind of a breakdown of the awards um, that we will be bringing forth at the end of the year. And it's important to, to note that this process, if you remember going back to January of last year, we talked about kind of the board's desire and our desire to kind of have a fundamental change in how we go about conducting the business of the county. And that's from a leadership perspective and really kind of just a holistic approach. Um, since that time, we've been kind of going through this iteration and this process of trying to understand where we are, where our areas of improvement are, and kind of where our leadership felt they were um, in their professional and personal development. And that's just kind of the first major initiative that we're bringing forth um, as a result of those conversations. Go ahead. Um, if you'll remember, the shift comprises a range of initiatives that are dedicated to fostering diversity and inclusion within Clayton County government. Our aim is to cultivate an environment where employees thrive, excel, and find fulfillment in their work through active listening and inclusion. We ensure that every voice is valued by embracing diversity. We empower everyone to contribute to enhanced processes and organizational efficiencies within their roles. Go ahead. When we started this program, we sat down and we built out kind of what we deem our four-step process to building an engaged workforce. 
And this has kind of been our roadmap as we've rolled out different initiatives with our leadership and fostered different conversations with them. Um, step one was to, to define what our current culture was through our series of engagement surveys, which we rolled out over the first few months. We set an action plan of how we were gonna mitigate that, and this is some of the results of those early studies and those early surveys that we did. And then we're evaluating that quarterly. We're now moving into step two of our process, which is building out our mentorship program for our department leadership. Um, and we're starting that kickoff with that, but we wanted to bring that to the forefront by putting out an initiative to look at recognizing the work that our leadership does um, on a yearly basis and a daily basis for the county. Go ahead. <clears throat> um, just a real brief timeline of some of the events that we did. As I said, this all came about in early January. Um, I started working directly with the COO to kind of lay out what would this process look like. So in May, we sent out our first change readiness survey. And that was done just to kind of gauge where our department leadership was and where they felt their role would be in a change or a shift, so to speak. Um, we followed that up in August with a very comprehensive engagement survey that covered about 10 to 15 different elements. Um, it was about 55 questions long. Um, we got that data in. We correlated all that data. That related to department interviews that were held the month of September. Um, Chief Fordham went out, had one-on-one -on -one interviews with department heads and just kind of talked to them about diversity and inclusion, what that means to them and their organization. We then, based off all that data, broke everybody up into what we deem culture pods. Um, they're individual culture pods, which are small groups or on their sleeves. Um, they have their own unique uh, logos and team names, and those were in your um, culture and performance report. I believe yours says commissioners. Um, we didn't want to name you, um, but we just named you commissioners. Um, so outside of the culture pods, um, you remember we had the big culture pod Greg Gray event over at the Performing Arts Center. Um, that was tied in with some leadership training. And then we had our end of year leadership meeting held by the COO to kind of go over where our events and where we would move forward over the next year. So briefly, just to kind of give you um, some, fee or some ideas of where we came up with the leadership recognition program. Go ahead, ma'am. Um, go ahead. Um, one of the big survey components was feedback and recognition in our engagement survey. And as you can see, overall for the factor score, we scored a 55% favorable rating for how our leadership feels they are recognized. And that's comprised of the two questions that you see highlighted in the red box. Um, the first question was the right people are rewarded and recognized at Clayton County, which had a 44% favorable rating. And the second one was I receive appropriate recognition for good work at Clayton County that had a 63% favorable rating. So when you factor those in together overall, it came with 55% favorable, 32% neutral, and 13% were unfavorable. So we kind of just focused on this metric and several other ones as to what is some low hanging fruit that we can put out there um, to show the leadership how much we appreciate them and the work that they do for the citizens of the county. Also to kind of increase engagement and communication back and forth between the office of the COO and our leadership and the board, um, because this is a top-down program that, that we put in play here. It was the, the will of this board for us to engage our leadership um, more directly and understand how do we create a more productive and synergistic workforce. So one of the ways that we'll be doing it is by bringing forth an engagement app as well that we're currently building out um, that will be a platform by which department heads can communicate with each other um, as well as the COO's office about things that are going on within the workforce, not necessarily project related, but more interpersonal type relationships that we can continue to cultivate amongst our staff in the COO's office. So the awards program that we will be bringing forth, um, this program will be a year long program um, that we offer several different opportunities for our pods um, to participate in. The primary goals of these awards is to encourage efforts and recognize results to enhance our employee morale, promote teamwork within and between departments through the culture pods, and then ensure leadership support for our employees. As I said, I wanted this to be an all-inclusive process, so y'all are included, and you have awards that, that you can also put out there. So our first award that we will issue will be called the Commissioner's Cup. The Commissioner's Cup will be an overall award that's given to the culture pod that accumulates the highest points in different initiatives hosted by the office of the COO. That may be team presentations at meetings, team trivia, cookout competitions, and more. 
So as we go throughout the year, we may award certain points for their participation in community events, commissioner events, whatever the case may be. We'll tally all those up at the end of the year and make a recommendation to you um, to issue what will be our initial this year inaugural Commissioner's Cup. Um, so we view that as kind of a, a, a perpetual trophy, kind of Stanley Cup-ish, um, where the pod name will just kind of have their name on it and they get to keep it for the year. The next award, um, these are what we're determining uh, are terming Excellence and Action Awards. These are district awards. So these honors are um, honors exceptional employee contributions in a designated commissioner district. Eligible nominees demonstrate remarkable dedication, initiative, and impact on projects benefiting constituents. Um, examples may include involvement in district-specific park beautification or volunteering support to youth organizations in different districts. As you can see, there are five um, awards presented, one per commissioner. This is your choice. Um, and it does not have to be a department head. It can be any county employee that provides exemplary service um, to your district. Um, in whatever shape, form, or fashion. Um, so that's kind of left up to you to determine um, what that recognition can be. It certainly can be um, a department head, but is not specific to a department head. Next. Next, obviously, we have our Director of the Year Award, and this award is based on a thorough assessment of nominations received from employees countywide. The criteria for winning the award will focus on the department head who has shown exceptional collaboration with and between departments, active engagement, and, and has notably improved employees' work experiences as reported by those employees. Um, so there will be um, a platform that comes out. We'll be working with IT here um, in the next few weeks to develop a platform by which nominations can be brought in throughout the year. Um, we'll gather those. We'll come up with the top three or so, and then we will forward those over to the board to make a decision whom they feel is worthy of the director of the year. Next, deputy director of the year follows the same criteria. It's just held for the deputy director um, position or that number two kind of in management position, depending on how each individual department is structured. And then finally, um, the award that will be offered by the chief operating officer um, is termed our culture champion. And this um, will grant this award to the individual who epitomizes the shift's principles and serves as its foremost exemplar. The recipient will be the one who has made the most significant impact on the initiative spearheaded by the COO's office, particularly in fostering collaboration among pod members, generating innovative ideas to engage the pods, and actively promoting harmony and accountability within the team. And obviously, there's only one of those per year. So. It is our hope and our wish. Um, we've included some funding in the COO's budget, if y'all so choose to approve it, um, to where we can have this program, fund this program, and then have a nice banquet toward the end of the year where we can bring leadership, their families, and all the award um, recipients together and celebrate a job well done for the citizens of Clayton County. Um, so with that, I thank you, and we'll entertain any questions you may have. Well, let me start by saying that we appreciate y'all bringing this forward. forward. Uh, I always say that our employees are our greatest and biggest asset and we really need to make sure that we give them the flowers while they're still around uh, they do an excellent job and we truly appreciate <laughs> truly appreciate wow. all that they do uh, any other questions comments uh, yes Commissioner. Uh, yes chief um, under feedback and recognition you had those percentages favorable um, something in the middle Neutral. And, yes and, and then I think it was 13% un unfavorable. unfavorable is there a way you can find out what I mean how did we come to that or uh, how do we get that number or is it something we can do to help with we that? can dig as deep into that ma'am as you would like to go so like I said there's probably 55 questions that made up that survey okay um, so within that we can bore down into that and explain exactly why they feel the way they do Okay. Well, is it something that we can work on? Absolutely. To, to make it better? Absolutely. There, and, and we held um, we held individual kind of discussions around the survey results, and we'll be settling those up with y'all as well to kind of go through what that survey looks like in total. Okay. Okay. But yes, ma'am, we certainly can. All right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions, statements? Mr. CEO. Um, first of all, I want to give a, a big kudos to our deputy CEO. He does a phenomenal job in providing 
context to the work as a whole. Um, but as we continue to move forward, and we know that um, the board, this board has been very gracious in trying to figure out compensatory factors, primarily around monetary opportunities for our board, for our respective employees, and we're doing a great job in ensuring that we <laughs> elevate that. But we recognize that sometimes just a, a, just a profound appreciation for what you do on a day-to-day -day basis go a long way for our employees because everybody wants to feel appreciated for what they do. And so we certainly hope the board sees value in this program and elevating that. And so with that being said, uh, we have one of our department heads I thought has already got outside the box. And I want to publicly um, applaud her for a job well done in cultivating the resources as a whole. The HR department just recently did a gratitude day last week, and it was really well reserved, really well received by our employees. So I'd like to thank Director Ambrose for her work along with her team in ensuring that we're always trying to find innovative ways by which we um, elevate what we do in the county, but more importantly, ensure that our employees see that, that they're certainly appreciated for the work that they do. So again, um, thank you to our team, whether it's Dr. Adhikari, uh, Mr. Fordham, and that team that really puts a lot of energy and time in our space. We just really look forward from the feedback from the board about assisting us with moving this shift in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you both. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Yes, sir. Mentor protege program update. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mr. Rogers. Okay, good evening, Chairman, Vice Chairman, Commissioners. Um, as we talk about innovation with the county, once again, we want to bring to you tonight an update on the Mentor Protege Program. This is a program with the board and certainly the support of the COO's office that we actually implemented in 2022. We brought to you all last year this first successful cohort, which was our construction. We quickly moved into our second cohort, which was our A&E firm designs. And tonight I want to give an update on that and also uh, make sure that you're aware of where we're at with our new cohort. So I'm going to allow Eddie Eves, who is our compliance uh, officer for our program coordinator, to give you all an update on where we're at with our mentor program. All right. Thank you, Carol. And good evening, commissioners. Uh, I, it is. Um, extremely grateful to be back in front of you today to talk about the mentor protege program and the ongoing uh, developments and updates that we've seen uh, since the first cohort um, we have been able to really refine and streamline the processes within the mentor protege program uh, to a point that we are now three cohorts in we've seen a multitude of success with uh, you know our different proteges and uh, we'll uh, jump right into the pro uh, to the presentation to get that started so the purpose of the mentor protege program is to help our eligible small businesses gain capacity and opportunities to bid on county contracts through partnerships with more experienced companies um, that are willing to fulfill that mentor role uh, we've been able to secure some really uh, tremendous um, companies to actually come on board the mentor protege program and actually work with our small local business community to develop their competencies really help them uh, get on a track with their business to be able to go out and do business with the county and to build up their respective uh, uh, competencies within their organization. Right. And an overall overview of the program, the uh, program was created in February 2022 and was implemented with the mission to foster a more competitive environment for our Clayton County projects and building a broader base of our uh, small, local small local business enterprises, which is our SLBEs. Um, the program's immediate objective is to strengthen the long-term stability of our SLBE firms. So again, cultivating you know those partnerships to be able to really learn and strengthen their respective competencies in their uh, organizations and focusing resources on critical business skills uh, so that suppliers um, that suppliers will need to compete successfully uh, in the open market um, so again we've been able to see with uh, the partnerships between our mentors and our protégés uh, you know uh, m across a multitude of construction a and e and now going into our third cohort uh, our construction cohort you know the ability to go out and bid on these contracts and do work with the county all right next slide all right. Trainings and resources. Uh, our protégés have attended virtual workshops and trainings where they have gained invaluable knowledge 
on contracting and topics tailored to areas of their company's development. Uh, some of these topics uh, rely in bonding, you know, again, putting them in uh, avenues where we can give them those training and skills to be able to go out and bond, um, um, acquire bonding, and also uh, their respective competencies when they're growing um, in areas such as estimating and contracting, uh, uh, things of, of, of that nature. Uh, our protégés have received training from our small business development center, SCORE Atlanta, and Georgia Tech Procurement Center. We uh, also want to shout out S the SBA. Um, they came on board the program and uh, uh, with their, um, through their Start Smart training, they were able to uh, really kind of lock in with our protégés and help them um, through an uh, eight-week course of developing their respective organizations and their business um, skills there. Uh, what we're very excited to announce is uh, the assistance of Tamika Puckett with uh, Public Sector and Education uh, Industry Vertical. Uh, she will be coming aboard uh, for our uh, most recent cohort that we just launched, our third construction cohort, where she will be um, providing assistance in insurance and bonding. So very excited about that opportunity uh, there and particularly um, coming uh, with the training opportunities with our respective protégés for this next cohort. Next slide. And business development is a critical piece of the mentor-protégé program. So we have actually been able to invite our, uh, men, our protégés out to workshops and professional events. Um, we've had a number of our protégés participate in our How to Do Business uh, virtual workshop, both um, virtually and in person. Uh, the best practice workshop for invitations to bids and RFPs um, and GDOT, uh, the DB marketplace, as well as our protégés coming out to our SPLA supplier fair. So again, um, having trying to create those um, opportunities for our protégés to really come out and grow their uh, businesses and actually learn. Um, and a critical piece of the business development piece of the mentor-protégé program is the professional development plans. Each protégé receives a binder with a streamlined strategy on how they can actually grow their respective businesses. And through the guidance of their mentor, and we actually have one with us uh, this evening, uh, they actually work with them to um, really kind of grow in those specific areas of opportunity that they really wanted to kind of streamline mm -hmm. their processes in. Uh, some virtual trainings that we've been able to offer over the course of the program is uh, pricing models for su successful businesses, local, uh, legal requirements um, for small business administration, uh, how to create a capability statement and great elevator speech. Um, I can definitely attest uh, in receiving capability statements for this cohort um, that, uh, you know, a lot of the training that the program has offered is really, you know, helping our small local businesses grow in their respective uh, competencies there. Uh, year in tax planning, um, that has been facilitated by SCORE and how to write a one-page business plan. So again, just giving them those opportunities to be able to come on board and really develop their respective um, businesses through uh, the guidance of their respective mentorship mentor firm. Next slide. So as with any program, we really wanna monitor the successes and challenges. Um, with the challenges, I can definitely say that we've been able to uh, see our protégés really step up to the plate and address those challenges. Um, so with that, I'll talk about the successes first. We'll go, um, some of the successes that we've seen with the protégés is uh, their recommendations for building capacity. Our protégé firms have been able to significantly, excuse me, benefit from mentors, tips, and feedbacks and gain insights into operational efficiency project management and workforce development. So again, all of this is in their business development plan. They work with their mentor on a monthly basis with those respective um, skill areas. Uh, our mentor protege interactions when it comes to building capacity uh, has gone into strategic planning that has provided frameworks to assess their strengths, weaknesses, and implement initiatives for overall competitiveness in the marketplace. Um, all of this is in, on a month-to-month -month basis with their respective mentor firm. Supplier networking. Our mentors have done a tremendous job uh, with um, growing our respective protégés in project collaboration discussions and market exploration, um, and particularly expanding the protégé firm's networks uh, and connecting them with potential suppliers and facilitating those strategic partnerships to access uh, specialized expertise. 
Uh, and lastly, uh, opportunities to bid. We've been able to see our protege firms actually uh, through their mentor encouragement and involvement uh, pursue bidding opportunities both with the county and leveraging insights and industry connections to develop uh, those competitive bids and explore a wider range of uh, project opportunities. Now, some of the challenges, and again, we've, uh, through the course of our cohorts, been able to see our protégés really step up to the plate in this regard, has been uh, access to financing. So they've communicated those uh, specific um, components. Uh, mentor engagements have included discussions on refining their financial processes and procurement strategies and providing insights and guidance on accessing those uh, financing options. Um, our protege firms have actively participated, again, just stepping up to the challenge for these opportunities in discussions with mentors regarding project collaborations and new market opportunities, uh, which have led to them actually going down respective avenues for securing financing through partnerships and project funding arrangements. The uh, ability to obtain bonding, again, which is why we are fortunate to be um, partnering with a public sector and education industry vertical in this regard. Um, they've communicated over the course of the program that uh, uh, in project discussions, their market exploration has opened doors, um, and particularly with their bonding capacity uh, through discussions with their mentor. And um, this has necess necessitated uh, bonding to our respective protege firms uh, through practical context and exploring their bonding capacity and reliability. Uh, with the additional um, ability of them obtaining bonding, the protege firms have actively bid on projects uh, with their mentors and have actually benefited from mentor introductions or endorsements, uh, bolstering their credibility and increasing, you know, the uh, their likelihood. Of, excuse me, their likelihood of securing bonding from insurers or bonding companies. Uh, we have seen through our protege firms that their ability to actually go out with uh, bonding companies uh, and actually secure bonding um, has actually uh, grown exponentially over the course of our cohorts. Next slide. Uh, we've expanded our outreach efforts. So we have now um, created uh, the first edition, now third edition, uh, of the Mentor Protege Program quarterly newsletter. Um, this uh, newsletter just uh, uh, it, it basically encapsulates um, both what that current cohort is doing and overall what the program um, is doing over the uh, duration of that respective cohort and over the duration of the program itself. Uh, we're three issues in now, so if you get a chance, I was like, go check it out on our on the Clayton County website. Um, it's uh, pretty uh, dynamic to see, you know, the work that our mentors and protégés particularly have been doing over the course of the program. Uh, and we uh, had the uh, great fortune to um, get with the uh, communications department um, and launch the first episode of the uh, Mentor Protege Program uh, podcast. Uh, that launched in September 2023. I'm sure uh, Carol will have us going back at some point to discuss a little bit more about the tremendous work we're doing with the program. Next slide. So we are actually, uh, with the kickoff ceremony of our cohort to architectural and engineering, um, this specific cohort saw a multitude of successes. We saw a lot of opportunities where um, our uh, respective mentor and protege firms were able to pair up in some actual alignment with uh, projects. Next slide. Um, this cohort actually closed out as of uh, April 6th of 2024. And we were able to bring on five mentor firms and five protege firms. Each of these firms um, were paired together, uh, and we saw a lot of great work with their respective uh, partnerships there. And uh, some of it you will hear tonight from one of our esteemed mentors who is with us today. All right, next slide. So some of the successes from our architecture and engineering um, cohort, uh, the mentor successes through our check-ins each month with them, they communicated, particularly Mursada um, Illich with WSP and George Fer Fergulis with Pond, how they were able to actively collaborate with their protégés on refining their respective uh, strategies and exploring future ventures. Um, they, uh, the mentors were actually able to really um, line up with their strategic guidance with their uh, protégés and uh, some of our mentors um, such as Keith Solomon with Gardner and Talia Scott with Moody Nolan 
uh, were able to provide strategic insights and celebrate those respective achievements with their um, protégés and particularly emphasize the importance of uh, the month-to-month -month communication and uh, uh, when it comes to overall project success with our uh, protégé firms. Uh, the commitment to collaboration, um, our mentors, uh, such as Mr. Wombo with Praxis, was able to acknowledge project alignment and identify areas for improvement and affirm sustainable collaborative efforts with their protégés, which have actually continued to uh, progress going into the closeout of this uh, cohort. Uh, our protégés uh, communicated uh, some remarkable successes, uh, particularly in the areas of just how efficient the process with, um, that we've, we've gotten with the Mentor-Protégé program. Um, we meet monthly with them. They communicate to us what's working with the relationship, with the partnership, what's not working. Um, we address those challenges internally and uh, through discussions with the mentor and the protégé uh, uh, come to you know a relative a resolution when it comes to their respective um, um, uh, any issues addressed uh, we've been fortunate where each pairing opportunity has been fruitful it's been uh, pretty successful and they have actually gone on to some some project alignment down the line uh, and uh, some of this has been in construction projects and strategy meetings uh, Protégés such as uh, Trofe Architects and RSC Technologies with this specific cohort have actively pursued project opportunities both uh, in Clayton County and outside of Clayton County. Um, and they've addressed their respective challenges and sought mentor guidance to enhance their networking um, um, and pricing strategies. Uh, and uh, just overall proactive engagement with our mentor and protege firms. Um, they've demonstrated uh, proactive engagement with their mentors, reporting progress on projects, and uh, expressing overall satisfaction with the program. Um, so again, they've been able to really um, uh, go out into the county uh, with the, um, the guidance of their respective mentors and work on their uh, uh, specific project strategies. Next slide. And we are fortunate to now be in the first month of our cohort three, which is our construction firms. Uh, we brought on for this cohort three mentor firms and uh, five protege firms. Um, we were actually able to uh, re-engage Mija Construction, so definitely want to give them a shout out. Um, they were actually a mentor in the first cohort and uh, decided to come back in and engage with uh, the county to be able to uh, take on not just one protege this time, but two proteges. And they've been facilitating um, services with them. Uh, I think their first meeting is next week, so we'll be checking in at the end of the month with all of our mentors to see what's been uh, working, what may not be working with the program, and um, as we get this cohort up and running. Next slide. And this is our cohort three uh, construction. Next slide. So what we're really excited about is our, um, our, our, our small business social, which will be held on May 9th of this year from 6 to 8. Uh, we will actually be using, um, this will be a time for our small local businesses to come together and actually network. Um, we will actually be closing out cohort two, uh, our A&E cohort at this um, event and uh, just a, a ability f um, internally with central services to be able to uh, show our appreciation to um, our small local business community and um, you know uh, really celebrate the work that they've done um, uh, both with the mentor protege program and just our SLBEs as a whole. Next slide. And with that I will open the floor up for any questions. Well, it definitely looks like y'all have done a lot of work. Thank you for what you're bringing to the county and the community, especially the small businesses. We all know that if our business, are, especially our small businesses, are strong, then they're going to be successful in our community. And that for it translates into a stronger uh, county. Yeah, so thank you for all the work that y'all are doing in that respect. Are there any other questions yes. or comments? Uh, Go ahead, yes. Commissioner. Um, how do you get the mentors? Are they volunteers, or is there some kind of uh, deal that you all have as far as qualifications? Yes, ma'am. Um, Commissioner, uh, what we do is that we do look at vendors that are on our current projects. 
um, that are performing services and we go to them first okay. to see if they have availability. So um, Pond Company, one of our A&E firms, um, also participated as a mentor. So we always go there first because they're familiar with the county's procedure policies um, and we think it is a good faith effort to give back to the county to uh, assist our small local businesses. So that is one of the things. And we do have criteria that they have to meet. There are certain expectations that that mentor um, has to have in order to ensure they have the resources to um, assist with our protégés. So yes, ma'am, that's where we first start. And then if not, we will also look at vendors who have done work with the Clayton, uh, the, board, the Board of Education. So we look at some of those as well because it's still a part, of, a part of Clayton County and that's where we start looking for our mentors. And the protégés come out of our SLBE program and they have to qualify for that as well. Okay, do you work toward the protégés becoming mentors? Um, we do work for, toward them becoming more primes so that they can come out of that subcontracting world and become business capacity to become primes so at some point we'll become mentors, yes ma'am. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I have one quick question. Very <clears throat> good presentation, great work, great purpose. At what point will we start seeing some dollar amounts as to um, the co uh, each one of these groups and their participation um, so that we can see the dollars going back into the community? Also, um, are we able to know if each one of these uh, five um, I guess protégés, how many of them are actually based out of Clayton County? Because the deal is not just to get small businesses involved, but to get our dollars circulating around our community more. Because we have so many contracts, mm -hmm. and they go straight out of our county. And I'm so glad y'all are going to Flint River. I was trying not to say this. So you <laughs> one of your um, protégés will probably say they know that floor needs to be replaced, and I won't have to keep getting complaints on that construction project. <laughs> Um, so, uh, great question. So, what we do look at is, uh, as far as the dollars, what we look at tracking is the number of bids that they have been awarded by their participation in the program. Mm -hmm. So, I'll give you an example. We bought the first construction cohort to you all last year. And um, so one of our protégés out of that, even though she didn't win a contract with Clayton County, she did win a contract with the surrounding county for, I think it was a quarter of a million dollars. So, we're able to track that if they are participating in our bid process, if we can see what they have been awarded. Uh, uh, the second part is when we talk about vendors that are in our area, the whole purpose of us doing the protégés, they have to be a part of the small local business program. Therefore, they are already within Clayton County. If not, they're within the county surrounding Clayton County. I'm, I'm very clear right. on that because mm -hmm. I once did that process, but right. I want to specifically know, just as you stated in the next presentation, for me, my one ask is to bring more quantitative data. I have no questions of the quality of your program, but in order for us to know whether it's truly working or not, and what's mm -hmm. the impact, we need the quantitative data. Because if this, and I'm happy for the individual, but how is it helping our basis of our economy if we are sponsoring it, if we're putting the money into it? Because when you're looking at the area, that's the metro Atlanta area. I want to know how many other small business owners that live in this county, based out of this county, are um, a part of this program. And we can certainly bring those numbers back. I think one of the challenges that I will always say with SLBE is making sure that we have vendors registered in Clayton County. I have the same concern as you. Mm -hmm. When we started implementing this program, I'm, I'm looking and I'm like, okay, all our small businesses are coming from the surrounding counties. Part of that challenge is having those resources within Clayton County. How many construction companies do we have? How many A&E firms do we have that we can recruit within Clayton County to become SLBE? So we have to look at what the county is producing for businesses to mm -hmm. determine how do they match up with services that we need. So we get vendors to register, and a lot of times it's not in service areas that the county needs assistance in. So we're very, 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 um, vigorous about going after Clayton County businesses. We actually work with community development to get the Clayton County business license information mm -hmm. and we go directly to those vendors. Mm -hmm. But once again, the services that the county needs has to line up with the businesses that the county is producing and that's sometimes a challenge. Got it. Thank okay. you so much. Okay. Okay. Well, I think 
your program mm -hmm. will help with that. Right. To promote more businesses, small businesses in Clayton County, and the more they learn about it, then you know the more uh, participants we'll have. So I think what you're doing now will help with that. And we've had vendors that actually have that um, actually brought into the county a sub, uh, I would say like a substation. So we've had vendors who want to be a part of the SLBE program realize, hey, I'm out of bounds. If I move and I have a satellite company in Clayton County, will that help me? As we enter now into the construction phase, we're getting ready to release a lot of SPLOS projects in construction, then we're looking forward to having those vendors on board as well. And before you all have any more questions, we do have one more little presentation we want to present. So uh, I'll... Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, we're talking Just about... one minute. We'll, we'll make it quick. <laughs> uh, talking about, um, you know, kind of tangible, you know, measurements of uh, success with the program. Um, we uh, feel that, you know, the testimony of our uh, mentors and protégés is a big part of, you know, at least a small piece of what the program is doing. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, without further ado, we wanted to bring up one of our uh, mentors from uh, our A&E cohort two, uh, Mr. Garrett Wama, to talk about his uh, experience with the program. Okay. Good evening. Thank you all for having me. I had uh, enjoyed uh, preparing to talk with you all tonight and looking back over the, the past uh, 12 months of participation in this program. We have accomplished a lot. Um, myself and my business partners are so appreciative of the opportunity to have participated in the Mentor Protege program, and I definitely want to thank uh, Eddie and Tammy and Carol uh, for their leadership and guidance uh, throughout the process. I know I speak for the whole cohort when I say that their encouragement and leadership uh, was motivating and the core of the program's success. Uh, my company, Praxis 3, is an architecture and interior design firm. Uh, we were paired with Kevin Champion, who is the owner of ME Cubed, an MEP engineering firm. Uh, Kevin and I uh, initially started meeting uh, once a week, actually, uh, for the first half of the program. Uh, at some point, uh, towards the second half of the program, uh, we sh switched to biweekly meetings. Uh, we had good momentum at that point and uh, good rapport with one another uh, that we felt like that frequency was sufficient. So we spent our first few sessions uh, working on getting to know one another. Uh, he got to visit our, our office, uh, visited his, uh, meet one another's colleagues. We developed an, an agenda uh, for to guide us and, and structure. I'm a planner by, by trade. <laughs> um, so we had very structured conversations and uh, always knew uh, showing up to each of those weekly or biweekly meetings exactly what it was that we were gonna discuss. Um, so uh, after we got to know one another, the size and organization of each of our companies, the services that each of us provide, uh, the project types that each of us are most experienced with and those that we wanted to be more experienced with, um, uh, we started diving into that agenda. Um, I was able to tap individual colleagues of mine that have different areas of expertise, whether that's human resources or uh, you know operations or uh, accounting, things like that, to address the specific agenda items in a way that uh, by myself I wouldn't have been able to do uh, to Kevin's benefit and our benefit uh, working together. Um, the primary subjects that we covered were on the training and development of new staff. He is in growth mode and, and he is bringing on new employees. Um, so that was important to him. Uh, both with experienced colleagues, he's looking for other leaders within his organization, as well as internship programs to continue to bring up the next generation of engineers within his organization. Um, so we reviewed ways of identifying and uh, onboarding ownership partners to that end uh, on the leadership level. And then, you know, Kevin is a smart man and is looking towards uh, his future business transition and, and how his company uh, continues on, uh, you know, in his retirement that may be some decades out, but he's thinking about those sorts of things. Uh, so we discussed strategies for business development and identifying uh, and really focusing our efforts on primary sectors uh, to develop deeper portfolios. It's much easier to uh, be awarded work when you can show that you've done uh, a dozen relevant things uh, than to be spread too thin, uh, in my experience, as starting uh, a smaller business as well. Uh, so we also did consider how to enter new markets with less experience, uh, strategies that we might use to pursue new relationships and opportunities, and how uh, uh, the development of fees work. So as an architect, we are often responsible for hiring an uh, MEP engineer as a consultant to our team. And so I was able to share very transparently with him what our expectations are, uh, what his competitors are charging, uh, rules of thumb for pricing projects that would make him more successful, not just with our firm, but other firms that he may be working with as a consulting partner. Um, at an operational level, we reviewed how to identify and track overhead expenses, something that uh, was an emerging uh, need of his, how to determine an individual staff member's hourly
hourly rates, something that made him able to really die in, dial in his fees and be very competitive to know exactly what he's paying individuals and what he should be charging for their time in addition to that overhead. And our lessons learned on tracking and maintaining uh, project profitability. Um, in my time at Praxis 3, we have grown from uh, fewer than 20 people uh, to a firm of 80 professionals today. So I think that that was especially effective in, in our participation with uh, the protege group uh, because we have uh, been a much smaller firm and, and something in between. And, and even today, uh, 80 people is um, in Atlanta, Georgia, a, or the metro region, a fairly small uh, architecture firm. Um, so we were able to share the tools that we use uh, that are sometimes fairly unsophisticated but effective uh, that we use to track our project backlog relative to available staff, um, which is a key consideration for someone that is in a growing firm uh, so they can identify the need for new work, whether they need to hire and other uh, considerations that come along with an evolving workload. Um, as important as all the items I've mentioned are in, in terms of uh, both of our uh, continued development, uh, uh, of equal importance uh, in this past year we've pursued work together and we've been successful uh, we're currently working together on an advanced manufacturing workforce development center uh, that doubles uh, both uh, in that capacity to train uh, community members for emerging and returning jobs uh, specifically related to manufacturing and industry that is happening here in the southeast that I think uh, this is the first of many projects that you know when I was talking earlier about uh, having a portfolio I don't I don't know how anyone got started doing anything because owners typically expect you to have done it several times before they're willing to give you a chance so this was our chance to do a thing that is new uh, to the southeast and to our region and I think that both of us will have plenty of runway for in the future as uh, many many jobs are being created in in our backyards um, that facility also doubles as an economic development uh, office building uh, so it's got a, a very um, diverse set of program uh, associated with it. We are interviewing for a very large project uh, with Georgia Tech next uh, month that we've been shortlisted and competing with two other firms on. Um, and of course, we stay on the lookout for opportunities in Clayton County um, uh, to leverage our relationship and expertise. And we have pursued work together here in the county. Um, as an architect, we have a lot of engineering partners too. We do work on some, some larger projects um, and those are typically connected with a larger MEP firm. So I'm, I'm talking about the scale of you know, thousands of employees and, and uh, satellitic offices uh, within our nation, but also international offices. And we had the thought and idea after a conversation uh, with Kevin's group that we might, they might benefit also from knowing some of uh, their what could be perceived as competitors, but really took on the challenge to be sort of extended mentors and work with Kevin's group. And that's been really interesting to watch because there are projects that the three firms, my, my firm as the architect, but then a very, very large MEP firm and uh, Kevin's growing MEP firm are all collaborating together. There are projects that they have continued working on together that do not involve me at all. So I, I'm really, I feel like a proud uh, parent in some way and, and watching them grow and, and develop their business. Uh, and I hope that he continues to answer my phone calls when I need MEP engineering support. Um, so uh, Kevin is an excellent engineer. He's got a solid foundation uh, in running a business. He's also uh, a great person and a person that I can now call a friend. So we're very, very grateful for the county, uh, Carol, Eddie, and Tammy, their teammates, and the opportunity to have gained the knowledge uh, throughout this process and developed a relationship with a consulting partner that uh, will continue to be um, uh, a partner of ours beyond the completion of this program. And so thank you for allowing us to participate. Oh, great, great. Appreciate you sharing that testimony. Thank you. So, may, so maybe uh, your protege can go with you when you do the uh, project at Georgia Tech. A absolutely. He is a member of our team, okay. and he will be interviewing with us. Great. Right. Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Ms. Carol, anything else? No, ma'am. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you all. Appreciate <laughs> the work Thank that you all are doing. Right. Thank you. Water Conservation Commission. <clears throat> Uh, do you have the slides? Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Commissioner. I should say, uh, and my name is Daniel Small, and I'm representing the Georgia Water and Soil Conser Commission, and also the uh, the um, uh, Clayton County Soil and Water Conservation uh, uh, District. Uh, and we want to thank you for um, giving us an opportunity to give you an informational brief on both the agencies and also the particular item that uh, 
we wanted to provide you with additional clarification on that was on your agenda <coughs> last week. Okay. Um, to save time and to provide you with information that you might refer back to, uh, we have prepared slides, and the first slide uh, gives you an overview of uh, the uh, uh, Clayton County Soil and Water Conservation District. And also it shows how the uh, Clayton County Soil and Water Conservation District integrates into the uh, Georgia Soil and Water Conservation Commission. And uh, this afternoon, or I should say tonight now, um, the purpose of uh, this information brief is to provide you with some information on the item that uh, we uh, reviewed uh, on your agenda at the last meeting. Uh, it was regarding the uh, MOA, Memorandum of Agreement, with uh, the Clayton County uh, Soil and Water Conservation District and the Georgia Soil and Water Conservation Commission. Uh, it's an uh, agreement, uh, not a uh, Memorandum of Understanding or MOU. But we wanted to make sure that it was understood that the, and you can give me the next slide, thank you. Um, and you can give me the next one, okay. The, I'm sorry. There should have been another slide attached to that. You don't have that? Okay. The memorandum of agreement, uh, I have hard copies for all of you to review. But, um, and the purpose of it is to uh, implement the uh, Georgia sort, uh, Sedimentation Erosion Control Act when it comes to the uh, relationship between uh, the counties, municipalities when it comes to uh, soil and water conservation and also soil disturbance activities. If you uh, look at the uh, MOA, the Memorandum of Agreement, it specifically lays out the uh, agreement uh, between the um, uh, county and the uh, district and the commission with respect to how sedimentation rules control um, plans are reviewed and approved. So with that in mind, we want to make sure that you understand that uh, the purpose of it is for uh, you to uh, sign the agreement and the agreement will of course be forwarded back to the district and district to the commission and it will serve as the implementing uh, tool between uh, the county and this particular clay, case, uh, Clayton County uh, rule, because we have agreements already with uh, all the other municipalities. And one of the requirements uh, of this agreement is uh, coordination and collaboration when it comes to reviewing and approving these plans. We're not taking away any responsibilities for you to approve plans, but it does require coordination and uh, regular uh, scheduled reporting of your activities. So that's what we wanted to do tonight, and uh, we want to make sure that that was provided to you. Okay. So at this point, uh, are, do you have any questions, or do you need additional information? Well, yeah, I would like mm -hmm. for you to, you know, specifically uh, let us know what it is that concerns you most. Uh, because last week I think there was a paragraph and yes. the wording in that paragraph was of grave concern to you. I checked to see who put that a particular resolution together. Mm -hmm. And in their uh, uh, description uh, in the resolution, it specifically focused only on one aspect of the memorandum of agreement. It specifically focused on the county will have uh, total responsibility for reviewing and certifying sedimentation erosion control plans mm -hmm. without approval from the Soil and Water Conservation District. Okay. And now that's clear and it's stated within the uh, MOA. But it left out 90% of the required coordination and collaboration that's required as part of the MOA. Mm -hmm. So when you read that MOA, you, uh, the, I'm sorry, when you read the resolution, you, it gets the impression that the commission 
and the district are turning over those responsibilities without any type of entitlements in terms of review and coordination and providing support. So do you have um, a, a maybe something in writing from your group yes. that could clarify that and maybe give it to us or to, to our attorney? Yes. To uh -huh. uh, in fact, uh, we have provided uh, um, the county with the official uh, sedimentation, I'm uh, oh, sorry, the <clears throat> official uh, MOA. Okay. And I apologize uh, the way it's set up there, it's broad sheet, but the um, uh, MOA that I will be providing you with copies of uh, lays out uh, that type of coordination and collaboration that okay. we will be doing. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, our attorney can get with. But we do not want you to go away with the impression that uh, we have uh, removed ourselves from uh, our support to your program in terms of the Sedimentation Erosion Control Act and Sedimentation Erosion Control requirements. So, I mm -hmm. go ahead. just so that I'm clear as well, so mm -hmm. the ask of us, first of all, I want to say thank you mm -hmm. for paying attention and getting our attention no to pull it from the ever. agenda. Um, that is commendable. And then secondly, so we're clear on our next steps. So your recommendation is for the utilization of this MOA or to incorporate the changes as you just discussed in response to, to, to Commissioner uh, Hamburg? To signatories on the MOA that has been f furnished to you. Mm -hmm. uh, and that MOA then will be provided to uh, the district for its signatures. Okay. And then in turn, it will be sent on to the Georgia uh, uh, Soil and Water Conservation Commission mm -hmm. for their approval. Awesome. Okay. Now we have uh, an MOA in effect for the county at this time. Mm -hmm. This particular MOA include the need for coordination and, and regular reporting. Got it. And that's so important. Um, and on a regular basis, we review your program and also uh, make recommendations in terms of whether or not uh, your activities, uh, land disturbing activities that you are reviewing and approving are meeting state requirements. And if they are not, then we also make recommendations on where there are deficiencies and from an engineering standpoint, uh, from a soil and water conservation management best practices standpoint, then in turn we provide that uh, report to your particular department. And your particular department at this time is the uh, Clayton County uh, Department of Transportation. Got it. Mm -hmm. So awesome. that particular department is the one that will be furnishing us with uh, those regular reports, and um, but we are not taking away that responsibility. Yeah. Uh, that responsibility still will rest within uh, Clayton County. Is there a mm -hmm. timeline? I was going to ask that question. <laughs> Is there a timeline? Yeah. Uh, we have uh, uh, we submitted this MOA approximately uh, a year ago. Oh wow! Yes, and we have been waiting for the county to respond. In talking to uh, the representative for uh, the commissioners here in the county, uh, they explained that uh, there have been several uh, situations where information was not being uh, complied, requests was not being complied with, and as a result, it extended. Okay. For a whole year. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. And at this point, we are ready. Uh, at this point, uh, at your next meeting. Uh, if uh, you can see, we'll sign that MOA and provide it back to us, then we in turn will uh, sign and then turn forward it onto the Georgia Soil and Water Conservation Commission for their signature. And uh, of course, they have to be notarized. Thank you, sir. Janet, mm -hmm. go ahead. Can, yes. we, can, can we, I mean, Mr. McTarp, is there anything you'd like to mm -hmm. Okay. Please. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a couple, couple of clarity items, um, as Mr. Small uh, addressed, there is a current MOA. So the urgency is to um, authorize the new MOA that their Soil and Water Commission has requested of the county to do. Um, I think the 
the uncertainty came between the language of the MOA, which they provided to us, which was presented last week, uh, and the language what Attorney Reed put in the resolution, which, as we know, doesn't regurgitate everything that's in the MOA. So um, I think that's where the concern came about. The resolution didn't speak to all the parts of the MOA, which n most resolutions do not go into multi-page MOA language. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's been clarified now, um, and we're, we're good to move forward with the MOA as originally presented by their organization to us uh, without concerns moving forward. Um, hold on once, uh, Mr. Chair. So I have a question on that. So if there's a space of ambiguity, why would we not clarify that? Well, I, I mean, I'll be happy to get with, with Attorney Reed to make sure the resolution specifies the finer points or, or the, the higher points, I should say, of the, of the MOA to make sure it addresses all the concerns of the requirements. Um, but the MOA is is what what he has here is what they were they provided to us. Okay. So um, the only reason I say that because it's not a problem until it's a problem right. is it's what I'm mentioning. The, it's yeah. not the uh, MOA. Uh, I do believe uh, that some emphasis has been placed on the resolution that Correct. you had on in your agenda that was not totally worded to reflect exactly what this particular instrument would serve. And I'm very clear. And that is important for it to be accurate. So thank you. And hopefully Mr. Reed and his team will get that done underneath our current, um, you know, operations division. And also, um, speaking the of descriptions that I've, I've given you uh, in that presentation will give you more information on the role of the uh, Clayton County Soil and Water Conservation District and the Georgia Soil and Water Conservation Commission. Uh, activities and support uh, to the to Clay County. Okay. okay. If I may ask, Mr. Chair, can we get that resolution at least sent over to the board prior and to the conservation um, representatives so that we don't run into what we ran into before? It is imperative that these things do coincide um, in a definitive manner. Mm -hmm. uh, I have copies? extra copies here that I can. Provide. That would be great, sir. Mm -hmm. And you can email me as well. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you both for your for the presentation oh, input, you. Mr. Matarco. Thank you, sir. Uh, Madam Clerk, that's the last uh, discussion item on the agenda. At this time, we stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>